If you have your Bibles this morning, I want you to open them up to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. If you don't have your Bible, you can get out your phone, find your internet app, and just type in 1 Corinthians 10, followed by the letters ESV. You'll be reading the exact same thing that I am. Also want to invite you to come back on Wednesday night this week at 6.30 p.m. Uh, I was at the Southern Baptist Convention last week, and a lot of things have been reported by the secular media and uh, about decisions that we made and that type of thing. And just let me say, the secular media is not always the best place to hear what's going on in the life of your church. And so I want to encourage you to come on Wednesday night. I'm going to give my annual report on the Southern Baptist Convention and tell you about some of the decisions uh, that our association of churches made and remind you that uh, we're an autonomous church. We're a self-governed church and nobody tells us what to do, but talk about what it means for us to be a cooperating member of the Southern Baptist Convention and what that will look like in the days and weeks moving forward. So please come back for that. All right, so we're continuing our series, A Different Kind of People, and as we've been walking through these passages of Scripture, We've come to a group of of, of chapters that deal with the topic of Christian liberty. And so I've known a number of different Christians that express their Christian liberty in a number of different ways. So I I knew one man, um, he refused to eat anywhere that sold alcohol because he didn't want to support the industry or appear ungodly. So if, if a restaurant served alcohol, he would not go there. All right. Uh, I knew someone else, uh, she was telling me, she became a Christian years ago in a very, uh, very, very conservative, fundamentalist church, and um, this was uh, in the height of the hippie movement, and so every once in a while, someone would come to faith in Christ who had long hair, and the pastor would require them to cut their hair before he would baptize them, and they couldn't wear wire-rimmed glasses because that's what hippies wore, and they weren't hippies, right? Right? And so that, that's an issue of, of, of Christian liberty and freedom. Can I have long hair? Can I, can I wear glasses? Those are the kind of things that we ask questions about as we seek to live out our faith in the world around us. And listen, the Bible's clear. Whatsoever is not of faith is a sin. So if that's how your conscience leads you, that's where you've got to go. So if, you're, if your conscience dictates that you cannot eat in a restaurant that serves alcohol— then I will pray for you as you eat fast food the rest of your life because that's about the only place left that doesn't, right? Um, But I'm not going to judge you because that's an issue of Christian liberty. But here's the question. Is that person's conviction expected of every Christian? Is my freedom as a Christian somehow curtailed or bound by another Christian's conscience? And that's the question of the morning. How am I supposed to make decisions in areas where I have freedom as a Christian? Now, as we've been walking through this, uh, these last few chapters, we've been dealing with the question of Christian liberty. Let me redefine that for you. Christian liberty is the idea that since Christians are no longer bound by the civil or ceremonial laws of the Old Testament, we are free to engage in actions and activities that are not expressly forbidden in Scripture or contrary to the ethic of Scripture. So in these In these chapters, Paul's been answering questions from the Corinthian church about what they can and cannot do. And what he's been doing is working to distinguish between essential matters like worshiping a false god in a temple and idolatry, which are always wrong. He wants to distinguish between that and non-essential matters with regard to food from the temples. In that issue, there's freedom, true freedom. And so as he brings this discussion to a close, he writes a couple of paragraphs that provide tremendous guidance for the Christian on matters of liberty and conscience. So I'm going to begin reading here, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23. You read along with me as we examine God's Word. Paul starts by quoting a slogan in the Corinthian church, all things are lawful. That's what they were saying. And so he quotes, he says, all things are lawful, and then he counters, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So if you go to the meat market to buy meat, you don't have to ask if it's sacrificed to an idol, and if you don't know, it won't bother you. Just buy it and eat it. Why? Because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The Lord gave you that meat. So he's reminding us by quoting this passage from the Psalms that Scripture dictates what we can and cannot eat, and the Bible gives us freedom. 
He continues in verse 27, if one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience. I do not mean your conscience, but his. For why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of that for which I give thanks? So whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many that they may be saved. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Now, as we think through this text, we have a number of questions that Christians should regularly ask as they contemplate their actions. We're going to draw some questions from this text today. Question number one, when I'm thinking about a decision, I always want to ask, is this biblical or habitual? Is this a biblical issue or is this a matter of habit? See, Paul's been very clear throughout the process. Our ultimate guide on matters of Christian liberty is the Bible. And so when I make decisions about what I can and cannot do or about what someone else should do, I ultimately need to wrestle with whether or not this is something commanded by Scripture. Or is it something that I desire because I've always done it, tradition dictates it, and it makes me feel comfortable if others do it. So a couple of weeks ago, I had a great conversation with a couple of folks that are contemplating membership in our church, and they came, they just had some questions for me and they wanted to ask before they joined, and they asked me about dress and worship. So as the conversation continued, it was like, you know, I've always been taught that you wear your best for worship, you wear your best for worship, and that women should dress like women, and men should wear suits. So what do you think about that, Pastor Chris? Good question. And so I said, okay, so you're always supposed to wear your best for worship. Now, and so I just asked them some rhetorical questions, hypothetical questions. Does that mean that I always have to wear my very best suit? Or will any suit do? I mean, because truthfully, I only own one suit. I own a lot of sport coats. So should I wear my suit every week? Or am I free to mix it up? So is 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 it my best or is it just a suit? For those who own tuxedos, should they wear their tuxedos to church? Because that would be the very best they own. Well, no. So again, the the ultimate question here is, what does Scripture command? And with regard to dress, all that we're ever told is that we're to dress modestly when we gather with the saints. And by the way, if you look at the context of the command to dress modestly, it has more to do with not flaunting your wealth than it does with whether or not what you're wearing is too revealing. And certainly we want to be respectful and not wear something that's super revealing. But the idea is when we dress, we don't flaunt our wealth. And we don't adorn our hair with gold and those types of things. That was, Paul, uh, that was the Scripture's point. So if anything, you could say, well, someone who always wears their very best could be flaunting their wealth. I remember when I I got saved, uh, I I went to a church, very traditional church, and majority of the men wore coat and ties to church. Their very best was a whole lot better than my best. And if my girlfriend hadn't been sitting right next to me in church, I would have felt very uncomfortable and out of place. That's just the way it was. So the question is, how we dress? Does Scripture command it? If it doesn't, then it's an issue of Christian liberty. Wear what you want as dictated by your conscience and be considerate and respectful of others in your church family. But remember Paul's admonition. My conscience should not dictate how another Christian celebrates or exercises their Christian liberty. That leads to legalism. So if your conscience dictates that you wear a coat and tie to worship, then by all means wear a coat and tie. But don't judge the brother 
who doesn't share that conviction. Because your conscience doesn't dictate how he should share his liberty, how he should exercise his liberty. Question two, does what I want to do hurt or help others? Does it help or hurt others? Notice how Paul starts. He says, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. So Paul's countering this, this um, Corinthian slogan, hey, I can do whatever I want, right? I got liberty in Christ. Go for it. Paul says, be careful. Not everything is helpful and not everything builds up. And listen, Paul can say this because what's he been doing? As he's been introducing the topic of Christian liberty, he's reminded us that he has actually refrained from exercising his Christian liberty in a number of different areas. He actually had the right to take a paycheck from the Corinthian church and he refused to do so because it would have placed an undue burden on them. He had the right to take along a believing wife, but he chose to remain single because it made it easier for him to do ministry. And he shared with us how he experienced multiple times physical abuse at the hands of others just so he could continue to preach the gospel and did it all for the sake of others. And so he's challenging the Corinthian church to live in the very same way. Yes, you have freedom in Christ, but when you exercise your freedom in Christ, you're always thinking about others. So this approach to exercising our liberty requires a concern for others. And that means you have to remind yourself that the world and your church doesn't revolve around you. You have to ask yourself, what's going to be good for others? What's going to help others? What's going to build others up? Even the way we do things, we're always asking, does this build up someone or does it tear them down? I mean, you have, you have freedom in Christ to talk about what you think is going on in your church. But the way you do it can either build others up or tear others down. So exercise your liberty appropriately. You, you have to develop this conviction. You have to constantly remind yourself that it's not about you. A big part of spiritual growth. Listen to me, church. One of the the greatest things you can do to take huge leaps in your walk with Christ is to get over yourself. You, You just have to get to the point where you don't think the world and your church revolves around you. And when you get there, life is so much better. Because you're not always angry and ticked off and looking for a reason to be offended. And you find joy and peace in the success and blessings of others. So this approach requires concern for others if we, as we exercise liberty. It also requires humility. Remember what the Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but to the interests of others. Here Paul's challenging us to count others more significant. That means we think their needs and desires may be more important than ours. That means their conclusions about actions may be right or should at least affect the way we live our lives. And that's what humility is, okay? It's not just being soft-spoken. It's actually listening and watching out for others. That's why Paul says, give no offense to the Jews or the Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my advantage, but that of many that they may be saved. So yeah, there are going to be times when you have the freedom to do something as a Christian, but because of the potential impact your exercise of liberty may affect someone else, you will choose not to do it. Now, Paul's very clear. They have no right to come to you and tell you what you're doing is wrong. But at the same time, out of concern for them, you might voluntarily choose not to do something. We're we're very others-centered as we follow Christ. Next question we ask ourselves is, does this advance or hinder the gospel? 
Paul says in verse 28, but if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience. I do not mean your conscience, but his. So here, Paul is challenging us to avoid violating the moral compass of an unbeliever. Now, that's really hard to do in America today, right? Because most unbelievers, they just don't have a lot of moral compass. And so you can pretty much do whatever you want as an American and you're not going to offend them. But in other countries, this is a legitimate issue. So predominantly Muslim countries, for example, there you have to be considerate of their expectations in order to win an opportunity to share the gospel. So several years ago, I took a three-week-long mission trip to Indonesia, and I taught in the Indonesian Baptist Theological Seminary, taught spiritual warfare for two weeks, had a great time with the students. And then for the third week, we went to what are called the Spice Islands. These are the islands that Christopher Columbus went looking for when he landed in the Americas, right? So these tiny little islands, 99% Muslim, very small group of Christians on the island. And there had actually been a lot of uh, persecution of the Christians and fights and that type of thing that had broken out. And so, but it had been a long couple of weeks, and I'd eaten a lot of really strange food. And as we got to the island, there was an American-style fried chicken restaurant, and I was stoked about it. That's where we're going to lunch. And so we walked in. I was hungry. We'd been going out witnessing all day. It had been a long day. It was hot. I sat down in the air conditioning at the mall, started eating this fried chicken, and I was two-fisting it, right? I had chicken leg in, one, in my left hand and a big old glass of Coke in the other, and it was just, I was going to town. And finally, the missionary leans over and taps me on the shoulder, and he's like, Chris, you've got to stop eating your chicken with your left hand. You're making a scene. Now, in Islam, the left hand is considered unclean because Islam teaches that the left hand is used exclusively for cleanliness issues in the bathroom. That's the most polite way I can say it, all right? So you never offer to shake hands with a Muslim using your left hand. You know how some of y'all do if you got something in your right hand, you see someone, hey, how's it going? You would never do that with a Muslim. It's offensive. And you certainly never handle food with your left hand. Now, he says this to me, and my first thought is, dude, I wash my hands when I go to the bathroom, and I just slathered them up in hand sanitizer. My hands are clean. Scripture is silent about this issue. I can do whatever I want. But as the only white guy in the place and one of the few Americans on the island, everybody was watching me. And if I hope to have opportunities to discuss the gospel, I had to make sure I wasn't violating the moral compass of those who lived there. If I'd continued to eat with my left hand, it would have convinced them that I was nasty, that Christianity had nothing to offer, and it would not have given me an opportunity to witness to them. And so eventually I had to just put my left hand behind myself because I started eating with my right hand, and then I would drink with my left hand. I was like, nope, I'm just going to sit on my hand and just do everything right-handed, right? So that's what I did. Now, within our family, if we're to heed the teaching of Scripture on this issue, we refuse to allow issues such as this to divide us. Remember Paul's admonition, food doesn't make you more spiritual, you're, no, you're not more spiritual if you eat certain food. You're not more spiritual if you refrain from eating certain food. You're not more spiritual if you wear a suit. You're not more spiritual if you refrain from wearing a suit. You're not more spiritual if you wear slacks. You're not more spiritual if you wear shorts. You're not less spiritual if you wear slacks. You're not less spiritual if you wear shorts. So within our church family, the teaching of Scripture is we're going to live out our freedom in Christ, and we're not going to judge others for drawing conclusions different than us on non-essential matters, and we're going to exercise our liberty in a way that doesn't unnecessarily offend those around us. So we heed the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans 14. Listen to what he says. As for the one who is weak in the faith, that's the person who thinks it's wrong to eat meat sacrificed to idols. That's the person who thinks it's wrong to wear shorts and a t-shirt to church. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, not to, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while a weak person eats only vegetables. 
Let, the one, let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. And let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are to you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. So one person thinks it's wrong to exercise or to, to do yard work or to go to work on the Sabbath. Another one thinks there's nothing wrong with that because every day is the same. What does he say? Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord since he gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. So here Paul's saying, we don't pass judgment on issues of Christian liberty. Okay, now this is why it's important to remember the difference between essential matters and non-essential matters. All right? There are a lot of people that use this passage and say, you can't judge me. And they, they're saying that with regard to sexual sin. Or they're saying that with regard to gossip and slander and other things that are expressly forbidden in Scripture. That's not what Paul's talking about. What he's saying is, we don't judge one another on issues of Christian liberty. If you feel convinced that you need to wear a coat and tie to come to worship on Sunday and that's the way you worship, then go for it. And we will honor you and respect you. And we will not judge you as being an old fuddy-duddy. And if you feel convinced in your spirit that it's okay to wear shorts and a t-shirt and sandals to worship, then go for it. And we will not judge you for it. We will not go, man, that person is so spiritually immature, he shouldn't even be here. We're not going to do that. Why? Because Scripture forbids us to do that. We don't pass judgment on issues of Christian liberty. The Bible says, whatsoever is not of faith is a sin. And so if the person is exercising liberty in faith, according to their conscience, we're going to respect them and not allow those issues to divide us. And there are other areas. It's not just dress, worship style, worship time, how we pass the Lord's Supper, what we do, how often we do the Lord's Supper. Those, those, are, those are issues of liberty. whether we go out on the boat on Sunday or we only use our boat the other six days of the week. That's an issue of Christian liberty. And so we show charity to one another, whether they have a strong conscience or a weak conscience. Next question, does this provoke, promote, provoke thankfulness in my heart? Notice how Paul talks in, in verses 29 and 30. For why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of that for which I give thanks? So here, here's Paul's point. Write this down. Your freedom in Christ is a gift from God to be enjoyed. It's a gift. He, he lifted the demands of the ceremonial and the civil laws in the Old Testament. Enjoy your liberty. It's a gift for you, and it's a gift for others. And that means not only should you feel free to exercise the liberty in areas where you feel peace and liberty to do it, you've got to allow others to do it as well. You can't exercise liberty in one area and then judge someone for exercising liberty in another area. Again, we're talking about non-essential matters. So don't become ju so judgmental of others that you can't enjoy your freedom. Don't become so judgmental of others that they can't enjoy their freedom. This is why we approach our relationships with tremendous humility. Final question. Am I following the example of Christ 
godly leaders and mentors? Am I following the example of Christ, godly leaders and mentors? Notice how Paul concludes the passage. He says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Now listen, if you don't know how to do something, just, just think about what I'm doing. He says I, I'm, I'm, he's, he's, he's trying to be a, a living, walking embodiment of the precepts of Christ. The author of Hebrews says in chapter 13, verse 7, Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Not sure how to exercise your liberty? Not sure how to curtail your liberty? Then consider the examples that God has placed in your life. Our leaders should be walking, talking embodiments of scriptural teaching. That means we should be marked by humility and reasonableness and concern for others. That's why scripture says not everyone should be a teacher. Because teachers are held to a higher standard. And they're held to a higher standard because Scripture tells everyone to look to their teachers and follow their example. And that means we need to work and be diligent to live in a way that brings other glory. And brings God glory and points others to Christ. So I'll be honest with you. I hate wearing a sport coat. Hate wearing suits. Hate wearing ties. Right? If I had my druthers, I'd be preaching up here in sandals, shorts, and a t-shirt. And I would not sin if I did with regard to my violation of Christian liberty. But I would sin if I got up here and preached in sandals, shorts, and a t-shirt because half of y'all wouldn't be able to listen to me. Some of y'all would be too distracted by my legs and the others would just think that I was dressed inappropriately for worship, right? And so when I preach... I wear a sport coat more often than not. Sometimes I preach in jeans. When I wear jeans, I definitely wear a sport coat. But I don't preach in shorts and sandals. I don't wear a t-shirt. Why? Out of respect and deference for the consciences of others. That's what's expected of me as a leader. Now, that's how we all should exercise our liberty. Now, I'm not saying that everybody here should wear a coat and tie for the sake of those who want to wear a coat and tie. I'm not asking that at all. Sometimes we do need to be considerate of others when we make decisions about how we live out our Christian freedom. So, it could be we curtail our freedom with regard to what we post on social media could be we curtail our freedom with regard to the way we speak about what's happening in our community or the way we critique a brother or sister or a ministry of the church. Could be we curtail our freedom with regard to what we do when we're out in public. We're always others focused. That's what God calls us to be. Jesus first Jesus at the center of it all, but others' needs and desires ahead of our own. When everybody lives that way, it fundamentally changes your community. It starts in the church and spreads to the world around us. So we've gone all the way through this issue of Christian liberty, and I've refused to give you a checklist. This is acceptable, this is unacceptable. You can listen to this music, but not that music. You can go to this movie, but not that movie. You can drink this, but not that. I'm not going to give you a legalistic checklist. The Bible is very clear. Whatsoever is not a faith is a sin. Wrestle with the Scriptures, obey the Scriptures, and where the Scriptures are silent, enjoy your liberty. But enjoy your liberty in a way that builds others up and doesn't tear them down. And allow them to enjoy their liberty without passing unnecessary judgment on them that together we can all pursue Jesus Christ.